Office of Gender Identity and Sexual Orientation in the Gender Justice Observatory of the City of Buenos Aires in Argentina. Please, thank you. Thank you. I thank you for being here and I thank Justus for being there whenever he is. Uh, I thought. Now? Yes. Okay. Well, as you know, uh, Argentina has a very progressive gender identity law sanctioned in 2012. The Argentinian gender identity law establishes gender identity as a human right. The law recognizes gender identity in the terms of the Yogyakarta principles, that is, understands it in an inner subjective experience which does not depend on the sex assigned at birth, nor the nor on the information on the ID, nor on the individual's physical characteristics. The law also grants every person the epistemic authority to define their own gender. The law establishes a procedure to rectify the ID information, and this procedure must be administrative, quick, and free of charge. Since 2010, our mental health law had established a depathologizing framework, and the gender identity law that followed it includes an article warranting free access to trans-specific health. There are many other virtues that can be mentioned regarding this law. For example, that it was conceived and negotiated by and for trans people. It is really a very impressive law, and in many aspects, it is a real paradigm shift for us. So, you might be asking yourselves why are Argentine activists here instead of working on something else? I say this because it is not uncommon for us to hear such comments in political meetings with activists from around the world. Even I often wonder if we have this gender identity law, what else do we want? Why aren't we satisfied? Why are we even often deeply frustrated with the political processes in our country? I would like to address these questions here because I think the Argentine experience can bring important contribution to global effort toward any development program, including the 2030 Agenda. So, why and how is activism still necessary after the gender identity law? There are many ways to answer these questions. One is to point at those critical aspects related not so much to what the law says, but to its regulation and application. In general terms, our gender identity law functions very well in relation to the modification of IDs and state records. It does not function so well in relation to the health coverage. In fact, it is quite deficient in that respect. Problems related to the implementation of the law regarding access to health makes trans activism still very necessary. Another possible way to answer this question is considering issues that are well beyond the reach of gender identity law. This is the case, for example, with redistribution policies. In this respect, even if the law was perfectly implemented up to its finest details, it does not necessarily cover every dimension of people's existence, and that again makes trans activism necessary. Poverty, for example, still strikes trans communities, and preparatory measures and or affirmative action policies are needed to solve this. Trans activism is necessary to design, implement, and assess the effectiveness of such policies. In this scenario, access to work is one of the current demands of trans movement in Argentina. Over the past few years, several organizations have presented projects for trans specific quota laws. This usually involve a 1% quota of trans workers in the public sector at national, provincial, 
or municipal level or even with it universities and other organizations. This is meant to warranty access to work for trans people as a means to counter the historical exclusion of trans people in our country. Still, trans activism is not only necessary to demand access to employment. Let's, let's consider this idea of access to employment. This obviously refers to the fact that many trans people are unemployed. It refers to a bridge between two spheres, that of the job market and that of people who are excluded from it and would only need to enter. This may sound simple, but of course it is not. Along with other activists, we have emphasized that focusing our attention on this dimension of access tends to ignore the conditions in which such access is produced, issues related to the actual jobs trans people have access to, usually on the lower ranks, the mistreatment on the part of peers and supervisors, the conditions of hiring and promotion. In short, focusing our attention on the access tends to ignore labor rights. In liberal context and or context of increasingly precarious labor, this is or should be a central issue that can sometimes seem diluted among other demands. It is the task of trans activism again to call attention to these matters. But there is something else that we should be aware of regarding this idea of access to employment. This idea of trans people as simple people who do not have a job and have to access one. The point is that this approach fails to notice the daily work of the daily work that trans people must do in every place they inhabit. I would like to say a few words about this. On a daily basis, trans people carry an advocacy work in the institutions they inhabit. They do so through education, that is, educating cis people on the nature of the oppressions they face and the strategies to dismantle such oppressions. These are sometimes anonymous individual processes, in the sense it is a minute painstaking labor that moves forward slowly but firmly. Every day, these people deploy the role as educators with their neighbors, with anyone behind the counter, with doctors, friends, and families. In other cases, they assume large scale challenges and, for example, share their experience and knowledge in panels, documentaries, interviews published in specialized journals. They attend work meetings and institutions in international organizations and they answer questions for more PhD and MA dissertations that you can imagine with no compensation. And this usually results in an academic growth of the researchers and not of the communities that were object of the research. Let me take myself as an example. In the last six years, I have participated in research in the areas of sociology, anthropology, law, literary theory, political science, gender studies, social work, arts, and medicine. These researches were directed by academics who have research grants whose requirements make them unattainable for many trans people, among which I include myself. Why would these people who are inherently non-expert on trans issues be given the opportunity to lead research on work other than through cissexism. Going back in either of these modes, small scale or large scales, which can even happen simultaneously, trans people carry an enormous workload which gives them no rest nor holidays. It is a magnificent advocacy work grounded in expert knowledge. So before moving on, I would like to make this clear. Trans people are working. Their work is necessary and brilliant, but they are not being paid. paid. They are doing a job for which they are not being retributed, neither materially nor symbolically. More often than not, 
it is cis people who take the credit for it. This phenomenon is often imperceptible. It is a job they cannot quit and has very high emotional cost. And while we are talking about a sustainable development agenda, we can think of this as a case of exploitation, epistemic exploitation. Here, historically oppressed people are requested directly or indirectly because they are asked to or because their survival depends on it, to produce, share, and transmit their knowledge, and particularly knowledge about their own oppressions. The burden of the proof is inverted, and trans people are often required to give proof of their marginalization and come up with ideas on how to revert it, but without being acknowledged as epistemic agents, at least as pairs of cis people. This maintains the structures that are being denounced in order. Since the labor comes from the side of the marginalized group, while the pavement and the recognitions are for the privileged one. These practices are often embedded in well-intentioned requests, people, where people external to the community express their interest in learning about it in order to help change their conditions. Other times, of course, it is not well-intentioned at all. So, coming back to our first question regarding what has to be done even in a very progressive legislative context. This is work trans activism and trans people in general are already doing every day. And it's fundamental work with highly beneficial results. It is trans people's work that that gave us the law we have in Argentina. This law couldn't have been the same if our legislative process had not been led by trans people. This kind of work is needed to achieve the ambitious objective of any development program, but it has to be institutionally recognized as work. So, to make any development agenda possible, it's necessary to consider the ways in which this dynamic harms epistemic communities and envision the structural remedies that it demands. Here, good intentions and a mere avowal are not enough. What I am trying to say is trans people must not only be called for collaboration in processes regarding development policies, they must be leading these processes. That is, that is a way to remedy these asymmetric dynamics and to guarantee the necessary work trans people provide. Bringing back to the title and trust of this session, where do we go from here safeguarding trans people's rights? Where we go is clear. Cis people in position of leadership or authority on trans and gender diverse issues should step aside and act as allies to our communities insist that their positions be filled by trans people and insist that funding for studies of us go through the hands of trans leadership. Thank you. Mm -hmm.